In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's such a pleasure to see you all here this morning. Thank you for braving the traffic to be here. Uh, my name is Maggie, and I'm the associate priest here for the whole of this summer. Our rector, Della, is away on a mission trip, and so I'm standing in for her while she's gone. Today, the Feast of the Transfiguration, a day when we remember the extraordinary story that's related in three of the four Gospels and also in the letter written much later by St. Peter. Some people think that somebody, somebody else wrote the letter but wrote it on his behalf. But in any case, Peter's version also got told. And there are so many threads in this story of Jesus going up the mountain and being transformed. It tells us something about the connection between the old covenant and the new, about the identity of Jesus, about his connection to the prophets, about the relationship of the Holy Trinity, and so much more. But today, I want to put the spotlight on what is almost a subplot, if you like. And it's what happened to those three disciples on this extraordinary day. And what does that mean for us? I've told you before that I like hiking up hills. But when Jesus said to his friends, let's go up the mountain to pray, I think they immediately knew that this was not just a nice weekend walk, not just a stroll in the park, because let's go up the mountain to pray was a kind of code. Most of the important revelations in the scriptures, all the way from the beginning of the Hebrew scriptures right through to the end of the New Testament, involve a high mountain. It was on that high mountain that God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his own son and revealed to him that God would provide the necessary sacrifice. It was on a mountaintop, as we've just heard, that the commandments were given to Moses. It was a mountaintop where Jesus was when he overcame his temptation with the devil. Mountaintops mean something. Mountaintops are about a particular kind of engagement with God. So as Peter and James and John walked up the mountain that day with Jesus, I think they already knew something special was going to happen, but I am pretty sure they did not quite expect this. Two giants of religious history, Moses, the lawgiver, Elijah, the chief of all the prophets. And there they were, shining with glory from another dimension. I don't know, I get goosebumps thinking about it. And as Jesus talked to them, he started shining too. Another gospel tells us that his face shone like the sun. Not like the moon, mind you. The moon can be pretty bright, but that's indirect and reflected light. Like the sun, full on glory. So much, you can hardly bear to look at it. Just a few days before this, it was Simon Peter who had come out with his bold declaration of faith. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And now they were seeing it with their own eyes. I think it's important to pause every now and then to contemplate this other dimension of God, this beyond us dimension. There's quite a trend in recent years to put a huge amount of emphasis on the kindness, the approachability, the here in everyday lifeness, if you like, of God. And that is a good thing because we do need to know that God walks with us every single day of our lives, walks with us when we're peeling the carrots or washing the dishes or walking the dog or whatever it happens to be. That's a good thing. Our faith is woven into ordinary, everyday reality. The name of our church, Emmanuel, literally means God with us, with us every day, with us in every moment. But if we are ever going to really get what this God thing is all about, we also need the other part. We also need to remember that God is not just like us. We are made in God's image. We didn't make God in our image. And we need to catch a glimpse now and again, like the disciples did, of that absolute otherness of God. The most dangerous thing we can do to our faith and our spirituality is to kind of domesticate God. 
to tame him, make him safe. The only possibility for the transformation of our world lies in the refusal to domesticate God. So our three disciples then are having an experience where there is no chance they would domesticate anything at all. This was really, really different. What happened to them? Well, James and John had that classic introvert reaction, which was something like this. <laughs> Frozen to the spot, speechless, not a word to say. There are quite a few instances in the Bible narratives where people have this kind of reaction when they're faced with a revelation of God's glory. Think of Zechariah, who was rendered speechless for months after seeing an angel. Or in the book of Revelation, John on the island of Patmos saw Jesus in all his glory, shining, and he passed out and had to be revived. Matthew tells us a detail about the transfiguration story that Luke actually misses out. But when the disciples heard God speak at the end of this little story, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Peter, now Peter, and I love this, all through the Gospels, stands out as the guy who speaks before he thinks and who talks his way through pressure. Jesus walks on the water and he goes, me too, Lord, I'm coming, I'm coming. Or Jesus miraculously appears on a beach after he is dead and he's cooking breakfast. Peter's out the boat in an instant, running to be with him. Me, Lord, yes, pick me, pick me. <laughs> An educationalist would probably say that his learning style is externalised. He can only think out loud. And up here on the mountain, in the silence and the glory, Peter starts talking, irrationally, trying to make sense of something that makes no sense at all. Shall we make you a tent to sit in, Lord, he goes. Shall we make you a tent? In fact, three, one for Moses, one for you, one for Elijah. Uh, uh, and as Luke said, he didn't know what he was saying. He was just talking because he didn't know what to say. So there we have them, two disciples standing there in stunned silence, and one who can't stop talking. And then the cloud comes down, and God speaks to all three of them and says the same thing. This is my son. Listen to him. So simple, so calm, so kind. This is my son. Listen to him. I like this idea that when we come into the presence of God, goosebumps and discombobulating as that can be, we don't actually have to do anything or be anything or think anything. We can just forget about ourselves and listen to him. And I think there might be something in this that relates to our worship here, Sunday by Sunday. As we meet, we have undeniably a form of worship that is crammed with words. We are Episcopalians, and that's what we do. Words, and lots of them. Some of them we sing. We do so beautifully with the aid of our incredible choir. Some of them we say. Some of them are said by one voice. Some of them are said by all of us together. And we have so many words, we have to have books to follow along, because who can memorise all of that lot? But in the middle of all of those words, where are the moments where we can listen? Just think about that for a moment. How much do we come to follow along and read out loud, and how much do we get the chance to listen? Maybe, here's an idea, when the scriptures are being read in the morning, you might like to put your bulletin down and just listen. Perhaps even close your eyes. Because when you listen to something read out loud, it hits your brain differently from if you're reading along in a book. It's actually something different happens in your brain. Try it. If you're always used to reading in the bulletin, just listen. One thing, two things might just suddenly stand out to you in a way that they wouldn't if you were reading the whole thing. Maybe when the choir is singing. God has done marvellous things. God has done marvellous things. Praise the Lord. You might like to.
to close your eyes and listen. Not just listen to the words, but listen to the feeling of the music. Because the meaning in singing is not all in the words. It's not just words with a bit of extra decoration. The music will speak to you. Listen to the music. It's good closing your eyes for music. Maybe we need to make more of the moments of silence in our actual liturgy. There are silent moments, but sometimes I think we don't embrace them or we perhaps get a bit anxious about them because, you know, somebody's standing there at the table and suddenly there's a big silence and you think, oh, has she lost her place? Is everything all right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. And, you know, from time to time I might lose my place, but that's still all right. It's okay. We have these moments of silence and they're deliberate. Like, we break the bread and we just stop. That is a moment to stand and look and think, this is God's love for me, writ large. Just drink it in. How much God loves you. And you get seconds just to think of nothing but that. God loves me completely. It's wonderful, transformative. But if we're worrying about where we are on the page, we miss it. Embrace the silent moments. I also, though, want to ask you whether we can make more little spaces for silent wonder and whether we have scope for just a little more of that. And I have been known in my life to do some unusual liturgical things. It's what I, uh, it's what I used to do and teach at Yale. And one of the things that I've done there and in a few other places is to build a cairn. Now, you may or may not know what a cairn is, but a cairn is, you might have seen one of those on the cliff wall, perhaps if you've been out there lately, there are a few. They're little piles of rock. They look a little bit like this, only bigger. And as people go by, they add a rock to the cairn, just like this. It's not, it's not Jenga, you know, if it falls down, it's okay, there's no rules, you don't lose. You just add your rock to the cairn. And when you do, what does it mean to add a rock to a cairn? It might mean, I'm here too. It might be a message to all the other travellers. You've been here, and so have I, and we're in this together. We're making this journey, and sometimes we walk by ourselves, but we're not actually all alone. It can be a bit like lighting a candle at the back of church. You know, you say a prayer either out loud or silently and you light the candle and then it's there all day as a reminder that the prayer is said. It can be just like that. Or it can just be a silent statement to God. I'm here. I'm in this. And travellers and pilgrims put a rock on a cairn and they, I mean, I guess they make up their own meaning. But it's very much, we're in this together, and I was here, and I'm adding my little mark to the cairn. And over the time, over time, of course, the cairn grows and grows. And if you walk the same path several times, you might add a rock quite a few times, and you'll also notice that it was bigger than last time you came. Today, and over the coming weeks, I'm going to invite you to stop down here, Perhaps on your way up to communion or on your way back, or perhaps as you come to church or as you leave, there is a cairn and it's going to be there for the whole month of August. And I invite you to pick up a rock from the basket and add it to the cairn. It can get as big as it likes. If it shuffles around a bit, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just add your rock and make it mean what you want it to mean. And we will see this little pile of stones grow as a symbol that we're a community, that we pray, that we're in the presence of God, and we're in this together. Transfiguration, then. It's an encounter with God that leaves us not quite knowing what to do, not quite knowing what to say. And if you are the kind of person who thinks out loud, the world needs you. The world needs extroverts whose natural inclination is to get involved and connect with people and get the job done. But every now and then, take a moment to stop in God's presence. Stop talking, stop planning, stop organising, stop getting things done, just for a moment. 
and listen. And if you're the other kind of person, a contemplative, and your brain freezes up in the presence of glory, well, the world needs you too. The world needs those of us who are scholarly and inventive and creative and ponder the deep meanings of things. But pausing in God's presence, you don't have to be wise or clever. You don't need to know the right answers. You don't have to say or think or do anything at all. Just for a moment. Listen. Amen.